Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Laurel Gray. I'm the National Manager of Digital Advisory at RSM. And our team have put together this session to really add to the conversation around the future of cloud technology for businesses across Australia. We're gonna be launching a white paper on the topic of accounts payable directly after the session today. And the conversation here is to get really the conversation going and add a bit of momentum to the topic. At RSM, we feel it's our role as a trusted advisor to not only keep up with the technology that's available in the market, but also to partner with the most relevant solutions and discuss what's next with technology. And there are so many solutions that are available on the market. We don't want you to feel like you're going on that journey alone in selecting and implementing technology. And in my role, I help businesses of all sizes to select and implement technology at the right time and with the right solutions every single day. And I've seen firsthand the significant benefits associated with moving to cloud technology. The accounts payable space is a really interesting one because it is an area where it's pretty easy to adopt the technology, uh, but the change management isn't always so easy to have happen. And it involves significant back office process change in order to make the most of the solutions. Uh, but we're seeing a lot more finance managers as our clients at RSM who are adopting accounts payable automation in order to take on more of a proactive analyst role within their organizations. And so it's been really interesting to see that progression. I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and it's my pleasure to introduce our four panelists on the topic of cash is dead, the future of accounts payable. First up, we've got Mark Peard, who's the leader of market development for the partnerships team at Zero across Australia and New Zealand. And he's a self-proclaimed payments geek. So it's basically his job at Zero to look after all of the add-ons in the payment space and make sure that that whole space is growing. Uh, and it's worth noting that Zero has its own inbuilt accounts payable platform called HubDoc. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Next up, we've got Daniel Niaz, who's the founder and CEO of DiviPay. DiviPay is an all-in-one virtual corporate card and expense management platform. Hey guys, great to be here, thank you. Next, we've got Vijay Raghvani, who's the head of customer experience at Airwallex, which is the world's fastest growing unicorn. Amazing. <laughs> Airwallex is a global business account empowering Australian businesses to operate anywhere at any time. And last but not least, we've got Andrew Sykes, who is our very own Director of Business Advisory in Canberra, and also our National Leader of Technology at RSM. He has really extensive experience in working with both technology businesses and also advising his clients on moving to cloud technology solutions. So it's a pleasure to have you all here. And I wanna kick off the discussion. We've already talked a little bit about why we're here. Um, I wanna kick off the discussion today by getting you all to tell a little bit more about yourselves. So can I go around, maybe can I start with you, Mark, and can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Yeah, so uh, I joined Zero around about four years ago, but prior to that, spent 20 years in um, the banking and payments world. So um, as you flagged, I have a, um, a nerd-like fascination with everything payments, um, which will no doubt come out to the viewers during my answers, some of which will be way too passionate and excited. But um, so I've spent the majority of that time um, in banking, helping businesses, corporates and governments use technology um, and integration to become more efficient with managing their finances. So anything through um, integrating payroll and bank um, uh, bank payments, bulk payments into SAP and Oracle through to using corporate cards or e-commerce shopping card solutions for, for really large corporates through to emerging businesses. So now I get the fun job of translating that into the world of small business, which is um, super awesome in seeing partners like we've got here today being Airworks and DiviPay that do integrate into Zero and see how... Um, those solutions from an enterprise space are now available to lot, uh, a lot smaller businesses um, than we've ever seen before. So, which is super exciting for me because, again, I love that stuff. So that's me. Oh, fantastic. How about you, Daniel? 
Yeah, so I guess on on my background, um, just quickly, I, I started my career at Deloitte, actually in the consulting space, working across risk and human capital. I then moved to the US for a, a couple of years, spent some time in California working um, odd jobs. And I guess that's where my, my passion for startups really started. When I got back, I um, went first though into Westpac. So spent about 18 months working at Westpac where I worked across you know, payments um, and innovation. And then after that, we, we jumped out myself and my co-founder and started DiviPay. And really what we found was it very difficult for SMEs to get access to traditional corporate cards or AP processing software. Uh, there's a really big hole in the market there. So essentially what, what we have built at DiviPay is a piece of software that allows you know, small business owners or finance teams to give staff access to payment mechanisms, whether that's cards or invoice payments, set really tight controls and workflows around the actual payment, and then automate all of that expense management once the payment has been made. Fantastic. VJ, over to you. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm VJ. Uh, look, with, uh, I've been with Air Wallets now for a year. Uh, prior to here, I spent most of my career in the ERP space, so I won't name drop any, any brands just to not offend anyone. Uh, but uh, yeah, I spent a long time talking to finance people around the processes and the mechanisms to optimize their businesses. Over the last two, three years, we've seen a lot more investment in cash in businesses and in terms of managing that. And the fintech movement has really shifted a lot over the last five years. And so uh, I decided to join Air Wallets to be a part of that, that growth and that change that's coming to the marketplace. Um, we've got a lot of expertise and that's on mid-market and growing and scaling businesses. Um, and obviously cash is really important there, uh, much as it is for ourselves, you would have seen our recent funding announcements and some of the work we're doing with states and so on. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about the opportunity to work with those small businesses and helping them manage how they collect, hold and then pay uh, with their cash, both locally, globally and optimizing that process. Uh, because it just costs those small businesses so much, right? And you really, you know, even a percentage point to five percentage points can make such a big difference for them. And I want to be a part of helping those businesses achieve that. Amazing. Thanks for that background. And Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Lowell. Um, well, I suppose it's uh, been a long journey. Uh, tomorrow actually marks 30, 30 um, years to the day when I started in the accounting profession. And I think that uh, I'm the last of the uh, generation of accountants that will start work without a computer on their desk. So my entire professional journey has been around technology and automation. Uh, when I started as an accountant, spreadsheets had only been out for about 10 years. Um, so what I've seen overwhelmingly and the what I love about what all these guys are doing with their software is that the, the, the client and the business gets the benefit. We're seeing uh, what are really, you know, not difficult, but easy data processing, low value tasks being automated. It's a really exciting journey to watch. Very exciting. And I'm so much looking forward to this discussion all about what's happening now and what the future is in the space, because I think we've really just scratched the surface around what technology is gonna be available over the next couple of years. And it's, it's hard for me as someone who uses technology to even imagine what that looks like. So really looking forward to this discussion. Now, I thought that we would kick off by talking a little bit about the transformation journey that's already happened in the accounts payable space, especially for our clients who are joining us. They may have already transitioned across to be using a tool or maybe not. So can I get everyone's feedback on what's been the most significant advancement or change in the accounts payable space over the last two or three years? And I don't maybe Mark, can I start with you? Yeah, it's it's been really interesting the last two or three years, particularly with the the um, I guess the acceleration from a COVID standpoint. We were already seeing great um, has heightened interest from a category perspective from zero um, in automating more of the finance processing and payments um, uh, processes. 
uh, and so had seen that as a category or a group of apps really exploding. But uh, COVID really, really ramped that up in that there was a, a, um, a recognition that uh, the more paper flying around um, when you're not in the same geography of everyone working from their home, it just really, I guess, um, uh, heightened people's visibility of the fact that even the most basic of tasks become more complicated when you've got a dispersed workforce. Um, that on top of the fact that with, um, and I mean, I'm sure the majority of people on here are, are finding it, but we're most certainly finding it in tech, um, finding people in the right place is not always um, easy. So the remote working and then making sure that people have got um, the right tools to be able to access in the right place has been another factor that's really helped. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's been a huge ramp up uh, in use of the solutions. Um, and uh, we're constantly seeing more um, people like the panellists that you've got here um, reaching out to us to say, we've seen this new problem um, or new part of the problem, can we develop an app to do it? So uh, I would see um, the, the card space and, and more real-time payments has been a, a really interesting one, not, not only led by smart people like, uh, again, um, Dan from DiviPay and the guys at Airwallex, but also some foundational work by the likes of the new payments platform and consumer data right, really helping um, to provide the, the baseline technology to really do some pretty cool smart stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, lots more to say and I'm rambling, so I'll let someone else chime in. There really has been an, an uptick in the pace of that journey, though. If you went back, and it's really that sort of question, why here, why now? Um, if we went back five years ago, uh, businesses were still printing out invoices and statements, sending them to their clients, and even businesses that were getting e emailed uh, invoices would print them out and then retype them in their computer. Uh, so the, the, the most significant change we've seen is that all that promise of computers, paperless offices, where maybe it's a pandemic that's forced us on it or, or, or is it um, the advancement in, in the technology? But it just it seems to be happening right now, doesn't it? Yeah, and also the cost and accessibility is a big, big aspect, particularly for small businesses. It's, it's definitely become cheaper to get access to some of these really cool solutions. Yeah, I was just going to say... Oh, oh. Yeah, Andrew, so I think that's a fair point, Andrew. For the last two years, we've kind of been shoved forward a few steps. So we've made a, a sort of a five-year advancement in tech adoption, particularly in cloud and automation, because of, well, if you haven't noticed, we've been strapped down for the last couple of years, I guess, in terms of being able to scale businesses. And so what you found is businesses are, and particularly small and medium ones, needing that agility, finding opportunities, wanting something that moves faster. Uh, and so, and, and, you know, the big tech, uh, big banks, those kind of guys, they just can't move with the same speed and agility that, you know, that guys like Divi Pay and Air Wallets and Zero can. And that means that you know, we were able to solve those problems faster for customers as well. So um, what we've seen is that openness to, to move money globally is suddenly a lot easier. Um, uh, interestingly, we've also seen a big advancement in tech sort of pre-accounts payable in that procurement space. And that how do I identify uh, where I'm spending my money uh, the shift to consumption economy is starting to hit as well. So I'll maybe talk about that a bit later, but we're starting to see that impact on how people are budget and planning as well over the last few years. I was just going to say from the, the actual technology perspective that I think has allowed this digitization of the documents is the, the leaps that have been made on the speed and accuracy of data extraction from that physical document you know, into a digital format. A few years ago, it wouldn't be unusual for a small business to have a dedicated resource, sometimes multiple resources, whose entire job would be the manual entry of you know, an invoice or a credit card statement into their accounting software. Um, but there's been a lot of enhancements in the actual OCR technology. And I, I think in particular, the natural language processing that occurs. You know, Two to three years ago, OCR was pretty rudimentary, um, 80, 90% of the time, any document um, that was being scanned by OCR was, was actually being sent to a human 
in the background to interpret and, and check the details. But I think the advancements that we see today and importantly, the ability for natural language processing to happen in the browser or actually on an app on your phone means that A, we can reach accuracy of you know, much higher, 98 plus percent. And all of this can happen you know, within real time or within a few seconds of you actually uploading that document. I'm curious if anyone still uses checks. We've had a, a few customers that uh, were still sending checks and it was a massive leap to move from sending checks still. So it's a really, in, really interesting position to, to hear that still being used. Yeah, if anyone's got, got part of their business in the US, I think they're highly likely to still encounter some checks here and there. <laughs> they're holding on over there versus Southern Hemisphere. I can yeah. confirm they're definitely still holding on. <laughs> yes. I think yeah. a few clients here in Australia still, Andrew. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, the occasional client, but uh, I did just see a comment pop up there from Lisa that's really annoying, and, and that tends to be the reaction. A check turns up, and you, what do you do with this thing? Where do you go with it? Uh, so, look, I, I think it's really, that does point to the fact that businesses that are still using those old-fashioned processes are probably going to fall, fall behind their competitors. Is that a, That's probably a fair statement. If you're not automating now um quickly your competition will be yeah it's interesting some banks uh, i mean some uh, some customers that use checks it's really a generational thing and they just won't change and and so certain banks uh have got functionality in their apps where you can scan it as part of a digital deposit so we're seeing bits and pieces but i i think they're they're um there's not too much more innovation we're going to see in check acceptance down here, I would expect. Right. So in general, the consensus is checks are definitely dead. Cash is dying and dead. And overall, as businesses are getting a lot more granular and real time about their reporting and visibility over their finances, it's they're adopting technology um, beyond OCR to enable their back office staff to make that happen. Anything else anyone wants to add on this one before I move on? I think just that general idea that everything we've been promised by technology over the last 20 or 30 years is now getting to a point where we can implement. And I think that's the most exciting change. Everything from the OCR to the SaaS applications to open banking um, to connectivity um, most significant change is, is maturity of everything that people have been working on. Mm -hmm. Laurel, can I just add a point on there as well? So, you know, from previous experience, I did see a movement moving towards EDI. I do find that that's probably not been adopted at the speed, and, and I think that's almost a missed opportunity in that sort of skipping the old OCR step entirely and having that data available and ready to just go straight through. So. Um, that may be a future question to discuss, but uh, I feel that's an interesting area to explore in this space on, on automation. Absolutely. And for everyone who's, who's on here wondering what, what's EDI, um, it's electronic data interchange, um, basically allowing suppliers, and Mark, you chime in here. I know you're, you're good at this one. Um, allowing suppliers to exchange data um, back to their accounting package or accounts payable tool automatically. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. e invoicing will be another one that that is is growing, particularly Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. It's progressing, but there's, uh, I think, to to Dan's point earlier, where we're seeing the most acceleration is where either government or or industry at scale have agreed on a standard um, way of exchanging data, which is really taking that friction out of how do you digitize something to then go, okay, we're exchanging pretty much real-time information to be able to act off it, pay off it, or manage cash flow, which is super exciting with things like e-invoicing. That's a great topic. And I would love to talk about it a little bit further on when we talk maybe about who takes responsibility for that data exchange um, beyond just the solutions that you all look after. Uh, I might move on to the next question which is another really hot topic. And I think it's, it's great that we can just bring the elephant out into the room here around robotic process automation. So 
RPA is a really hot topic. Everyone wants to build their own bot in their business. A lot of finance managers tell me that they think it's their responsibility to automate all the processes themselves. So how have you actually, as, as a technology provider, how have you embraced this technology and, and built RPA into your solutions? And is RPA actually self-learning, like we all think, or what amount of effort goes into building out that capability behind the scenes? Maybe over to you, Daniel, I can see you nodding. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I think there's definitely various degrees to what this means and how this works. Probably to answer the second part of that question first, you know, is RPA really self-learning? I think the industry is just scraping the surface of AI and self-learning. You know, the, the best of the best AI, AI companies in a lot of ways are really just really advanced regression algorithms in, in my perspective. Um, you know, this idea of pure self-learning, I think we're still a ways off, but there are some really smart people out there working on these things. So we'll definitely see big advancements you know, in the next five plus years. In, in terms of you know, DiviPay and, and how we think about automation, I guess there's, there's probably two primary ways here that we think about it. One is workflow automation that is driven by the business and requires some human intervention at the very start of the process. So all future actions can be automated. I think a good example is with our corporate card solution. You know, the small business is essentially building their expense policy into the card itself. So only approved spending can occur. So what that looks like is a small business will issue a card. They'll set um, rules and controls, you know, lock this card to business hours, nine to five for a total transaction limit of thousand dollars. And, you know, it can only be spent at, at the set of merchants. So what happens here is if you tap your Divi pay card, at a payment terminal um, and the payment falls outside of that business logic, we'll actually decline that expense automatically before the payment is made. So, so that is automation that I guess is first customized by the small business itself. The second way we think about automation is by creating, I guess, a rule-based system based on human behavior that happens post some kind of action occurring on, on our platform. So, you know, take a mundane task like categorizing an expense to a GL code. Um, in the first instance, we will automate that by using merchant data. However, if a human comes in and makes a change, we'll register that change and then apply a rule to all future-based actions. So, you know, for example, really simple one, but you make a payment for your Zoom subscription. Um, we categorize that for you as a software expense but actually you come in and you change that and you say, you know, this is a business service as per my GL code. Next time a Zoom subscription is, is paid for, we'll categorize it based on that behavior that you previously took. Um, and I think that is, is just, as I said at the beginning, is scratching the absolute top of the surface of, of RPA. So I think there's lots, lots more to come um, in this space moving forward. I love that. So using customization built into the platform to get the, kind of that low hanging fruit covered off um, that employees can set themselves or um, mm. employers or, or finance teams can set themselves. What do you think, BJ? Yeah, look, I think Daniel gave a great answer. He had me scrambling around for my notes, to be honest. But uh, look, I think the concept in there is, is exactly right, which is what we've done over the last few years as a tech industry is built in the capability to to enable RPA, right? And I think the real, the real benefits of all of this investment will come in the next few years as the customer is able to decide what's best for their process uh, in terms of optimizing what works for them in that regard. In terms of how we're looking at that, look, we're, we're kind of trying to accelerate some of that because if you look at the movement of cash, you collect money from somewhere, you put it somewhere and then you pay someone with it at the end, you know, on the other way. Um, where we're applying RPA internally is how do we reduce those costs between those stages? Because it's, you know, it's a vicious circle, right? And you lose points along the way. And so how can we remove that, say, 3 to 7% cost that the banks charge you down to marginal points? Um, and, uh, you know, RPA helps us internally to do that with the way that we move the money around the world and how we hold it. And then we can pass that back to our customers. So a lot of the RPA stuff, process automation, optimization that we do, tends to be on our platform itself. 
uh, and then benefits the customer uh, indirectly. Uh, and the second way is that in the experience itself is talking to those customers and understanding how they actually interact with the application and ensuring it's optimized for them. And it's sometimes as simple as I have to click at the top left of the screen and go down to the bottom right work. Well, we can see that that's taking time. We're going to move those things around. Um, so RPA is sometimes seen as a scary concept. Uh, I think the advice I'd give to everyone listening is just dive in and, and ignore the, the flashy words and the buzzwords, just get in and say, how can I make this process easier for myself or for my customer? That, that's a really good point, VJ, because what we see with the implementation of RPA or, or any automation is that 80% um, of the benefit is in the standardization of the process. So if you're looking at cost savings and benefits to business, um, the, the exercise of automating or implementing RPA really comes down to you standardize your process, but then so it then becomes apparent that, hey, this is really quite simple what we're doing and, and you can automate it. And that's when you turn to one of these software solutions once you've standardized it. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. And you know, I, I often see our clients coming into RSM and thinking that their business is so unique that they need a fully customized process. Is, is that what you see as well, Andrew? And if so, uh, yeah. how do you mitigate that when you're, when you're speaking to a client? Uh, you talk to them about costs and you compare the costs of a bespoke solution versus a SaaS solution. And, and all of these guys, you can go out and buy their solution for a fraction of the cost. Uh, you know, you're really getting that software as a solution. And, and then when you compare the costs of changing your process versus getting software to customise to a, 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 an automated solution, it, it becomes apparent that it's easier to change your own processes to, to sort of industry best practice. You know, that's a really good, really good point. And we see that a lot, right? I mean, our, our founders, Jack and the team really spent years developing what was innovative technology. So the last thing we want to do is have a customer say, hey, this is how I used to do it with my old bank. Can you make it do it like that? It kind of defeats the purpose of, of doing it. Uh, so there really is a perspective that when you are looking at some of the newer tech, just see what it does out of the box and does that make your life easier and see if you adapt to that and then build on top of that rather than taking your existing processes with you. Um, and uh, just sorry, I know I'm, I'm talking for a lot here, Laurel, but the, what we're finding is that the customers are moving faster through that as well. There used to be a time where with ERP, the average life cycle is seven to 10 years. What we're finding is with the solutions around that, the time to change, the time to evolve is getting shorter and shorter because the ROI and the time that you can adopt these things are moving faster as well. So um, yeah, if you're not looking at some of that tech that will make your life easier, exploring how it can make your life easier, you're actually missing out. So you don't need to re-engineer all of your processes, you don't need to re-engineer all of the business, take it up point by point. And that really is the whole point of RPA. And, and understanding the benefit of change. If we look at a very simple example, uh, back when we, uh, started adopting electronic uh, uh, bank feeds. Um, we saw estimates at that stage, the average small business was saving 10 to 15 hours a month just by having, hooking up their bank feed. You get that 10 to 15 hours a month back, it starts to um, mitigate the pain of change. And I think what's important is like we build SaaS software to be, as VJ said, like really simple off the shelf. And I think a lot of clients may look at it at first and go, you know, how long is this going to take me to implement? How much is it going to cost me to implement? Um, am I going to have an account manager? But the whole purpose of SaaS is that you can you know, join a piece of software and it should be pretty straightforward and you get started, you know, often within minutes on, on most of the tools um, out there in this space. I love that. And trusting that the software vendor knows and understands best practice. Um, I might move on just because this is a great discussion. Um, and I might, I might also add to, I'm seeing some great involvement in the chat. So thank you for that, everyone. Um, if anyone has got any specific questions, we're going to do our best to leave some time at the end. So please feel free to pop questions into the Q&A. All right. So on this note, let's bring this conversation forward. So what are the trends in the industry that are impacting the future of accounts payable? What's actually happening in the space? 
and I don't know if I'm throwing you under the bus here, Mark, but you know, you, you see this from a very wide lens. Can you start? Yeah, so um, with my hat on of seeing what was available to enterprise, say 10, 15 years ago, we're, we're now seeing at a fraction of the cost and at a fraction of the time to what VJ and, and Dan have also mentioned, available to any small business. So um, having lived, been in roles in the past that were part of um, $10 million plus dollar um, enterprise integration with bank projects that took three to five years, I'm seeing small businesses that can get similar scale benefits within a week and have rolled out a solution that with the equivalent impact to their business, which is mind blowing. Um, I, I think at the moment, the, the combination of that, the data piece, so, so less rekeying, more standardization of data and getting it into the right place, together with these really interesting um, payment platform pieces, whether it be say um, Apple Pay and Google Pay and wallets versus checks and even having to get physical cards to people, all of that has kind of been democratised and it's so much more accessible, um, which again was something that um, uh, was not available to a small business, whether it be a risk question for the bank or just physically a, a, um, a cost to serve problem where they just never could make it stack up to offer. All of those things have been removed and now small businesses, it, it makes me laugh, a lot of what I see with the solutions that are available to small and medium-sized businesses now is more data, more efficient than what the the business, the large businesses were seeing 10 years ago. Like you can do so much more as a small business and move so much more quickly now with some better solutions that are available for enterprise. So yeah, it's super exciting. And I'll stop there to let someone else chime in. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I mean, Vijay, you have a lot of ERP experience. Is that is that a similar comment that you would make? Yes, look, I, I, absolutely. And I'll certainly defer to Mark on that, given given where he is today. <laughs> and so he's definitely the expert on the finance processes and, and so on. Um, look, what we are seeing, you know, funnily enough, it is the impact of the last sort of 10 years, right? So being able to trade online has, has shortened cycles and the immediacy of, of supply. Uh, the supply chain industry has accelerated significantly, right? I mean, I remember about a few months ago, I bought something on eBay. It came from the US and it arrived in three days. I mean, you wouldn't have seen that, uh, you know, years ago. What's happening is that that's getting faster and faster and faster. And what, uh, what we're finding is that the, if, if you're sending stock out that fast, well, then the cash needs to move that fast as well. And so what we found is that um, rather than accounts payable and the whole concept of payment being reactive to, okay, I'm sending you the stock and you can send a payment and it's okay if it takes 10 days for the check to arrive because I know the stock's not getting there for 30 days anyway. Now, because the stock and the supply or the raw material, whatever it is, is moving faster, the cash needs to move faster as well. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're finding that that's, that seems to be a conversation that we're having our customers and the driver to, to use someone like AirWallets is, I need to get this cash over to country X faster. And if I do it, my bank is costing me 10%. And so, uh, you know, those, those kind of conversations, are, are what we're seeing is the world gets smaller, um, obviously on the growth aspect as well. But, you know, that comes from companies selling worldwide. They can now buy worldwide. And therefore, how do we move that money faster? And I think in a way, like people are even, the expectation is a step further where they think payments should now be invisible, you know, in the same way that you can jump in an Uber and then get out of the, the car and you pay it, you made that payment. So not only looking for really fast payments, but they're also looking for these payments to, to happen for them in the background. And I think the major trend that we've seen accelerated by the pandemic is the, the topic of, of this webinar, which is that um, you know, cash is, is in decline and um, businesses are able to use digital payment mechanisms now for everything from what was traditionally defined as petty cash to paying large invoices. So what that means is you can start leveraging technology essentially more effectively to enforce control and compliance with your AP process. Um, so I think moving away from cash 
to digital, you know, we're going to see for AP is, is a much more compliance, a clear audit trail, the total elimination of these manual processes um, and processing errors caused by your manual entry and also a significant reduction in fraud and wasteful spending just because it's all, it's all digital um, and there's a lot more control you can apply to a payment now that it is online and not you know, cash flowing around. Andrew, I'm curious to hear from you on this too. How re ready to adopt this technology are you seeing our clients across RSM? Uh, increasingly uh, more willing to adopt it. And I, I think the trend that we are seeing, and it's it's facilitated by, you know, now there is there's almost unlimited service space, uh, service space where we're getting OCR as a service. You know, Daniel mentioned how that's improved. Everything's coming together where we can now buy this stuff really, really cheaply. Um, so what we're doing is we're getting innovative companies solving problems that only big business had access to, say, you know, five or 10 years ago. A lot of this stuff is not new, but what a lot, what is new is the ability for small business to take it up. So we're seeing things that um, where uh, it was just prohibitive before and daunting. Now it's a, I'll trial a subscription for 50 or $100 a month, implement it and see how it goes. So there's a lot more willingness to, to jump in there and give it a go. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think um, Dan mentioned this, but the, the beauty of SaaS is there's, uh, I know of the, say, 1,000 apps on our app store, many of them do trials as well. So you've got this really good opportunity to do a free trial for, say, a certain part of the business. And if it doesn't work, then from Zero's perspective, you can unplug it and really the, the pain or the cost of the experience comes down to what learnings you, you take out of it and then document using your business. And if it does work, you can quickly scale it, which I think is awesome. Yeah. Like it's, and it's really being made quite easy for a business to have, yeah. a, have a small test. We're, and we are, we're, we're seeing that increasingly where, where small business owners are willing just to say, well, I'm going to give that a go. I'll subscribe, I'll trial, or I'll just do it for a couple of months. If it doesn't work or I don't like it or my staff aren't using it or it's not giving me what I want, then I'll, on the very rare occasion, um, they'll they'll stop using it. Um, yeah, and if there are, I mean, RSM's obviously um, got some great advice, but there are um, also a growing group of um, advisors. So um, if it is an expertise you're able to access within your own business, there is a growing group of, of people that are called, say, cloud advisory um, that are there to help. So you're not alone. Like you don't need to, yes, the solutions have great support, but you don't need to do it all by yourself if you don't want to. There is support available, which is really exciting now as well. Yeah. And, and if we go and, and, you know, I mentioned before about um, electronic bank feeds at 10 to 15 hours a month, if you're paying somebody $40 an hour, uh, that's four to $600 a month. And all of a sudden, you're not paying someone to do something that a piece of software can do. And we're seeing that really being appreciated by a small business now. Yeah, I think uh, look, we've had the opportunity to, to have Naomi engage with our business, Naomi Simpson engage with our business recently. And she's spoken to a number of the small businesses. And the view is that there's two, there's two types of small businesses, right? There's the ones that are and medium businesses, the ones that are looking for growth, uh, and they will be the ones that will tackle the hard things, yeah? Um, foreign currency, accounts payable, tax, those kind of things are the hard things, right? Because as an entrepreneur, you want to build your business. Um, and, she's, and she's saying that there's a trend that those who tackle those tough things and say, I know the FX is hard and I know I don't understand it, but I'm going to learn it and I'm going to employ an expert and get it done are the ones who scale their businesses faster. Um, so there's an interesting trend line. And when you're talking about small businesses adoption, I mean, it, it's an industry function for us to drive, right? How do we get small businesses and encourage them and give them a safe space to say, you know what, try this. It's okay. It's not, it's, it's not gonna break anything. And like Mark said, plug it in, unplug it if it doesn't work. It, uh, I think there's a lot of businesses and owners still stuck in the old way of saying, if I do this, I'm stuck with it for the next 10 years, you know? And so, uh, I think it's on us to educate the marketplace on saying, hey, try this. And maybe just as a, a quick tip there for anyone interested, if you, if you do 
sign up to a SaaS product and they give you two weeks free trial and uh, you need more time, just ask them. They'll, they'll definitely extend your free trial. You know, they want your business and, and they build their software because they believe it can genuinely help you. So um, yeah, you, you got to ask and, and they'll be happy to accommodate that extra time or help that you need to get set up on a new platform. I love all these comments and I'm proud to work for RSM because we create that safe space for our clients to test and learn and be innovative without taking too big of a risk because you always know that your advisor is here to help you. Um, and on that note, I actually might move on to this next question because it's, it's a really good one about, well, what's next? What does the future hold for accounts payable? And what are the biggest trends businesses need to be aware of adopting now over the next two to three years? What's on the horizon? I, we covered I, so much ground. Yeah, I, and I think we, we spoke about it, but it probably needs a bit more time, which is around you know, adopting these new protocols, um, such as e-invoicing. So essentially, there'll be all these new protocols which will take unstructured document types and standardize them. And I think that is the real game changer. So if everyone has uh, an invoice, which is the same format, then software companies can start applying greater automation for both the sender and the receiver of those invoices. So more automation will likely mean quicker payment times. That'll help with cash flow. It'll also significantly reduce fraud and, and kind of further mitigate the risk caused from, I guess, manual data entry that people still do today. So I think what it means for the future through e-invoicing is you know, we'll have access to really accurate line item data, um, which will mean finance tools can actually better start integrating with other departmental tools. So you know, for example, accurate line item data on an invoice can then be matched to say uh, stock levels to ensure an order was actually fulfilled correctly. So in the future, I think finance teams will actually find themselves working more closely with other departments and their tooling actually integrating more closely uh, in a way that we haven't really seen today. Yeah, I think also the, the fascinating space for a finance team now is because a lot of the data, if you've got a newer system, for, for example, zero, um, you're getting pretty much real-time data on the money coming in and money coming out, which is then a, a position where if you think back even two or three years, or maybe some people still have systems that are in, at the very best batch overnight updates or with some reports coming in monthly, thinking about the proactivity of cash flow management in the moment, particularly when you're talking about a world of real-time payments where you've got money coming in even overseas via the likes of their wallets at any point in time overnight, that you can then proactively be ready in the, in the morning to, say, invest it or, or um, manage your, your profile from a liquidity standpoint a lot more effectively. I think the tools that we're now seeing in our space that are helping with the, the basics of AI and machine learning to help predict what you might be able to do to be smarter about managing cash flow is super exciting as well. I thought the example of Uber was a really good example where you agree a, a service, you get your estimated cost for the service and then it, the payment process you're not involved with. Um, I think it's very similar in, in business, particularly small business, is that uh, AP doesn't, is, is a cost. It's not a revenue generator. It's a cost of operating the business. So the more you can automate it, the better. And uh, certainly that move towards, well, you, uh, you make a purchase, you're agreeing all your terms at the time of the purchase, and then you don't touch it again. So the whole uh, fulfillment, matching to stock, inventory, um, paid out of the due date and automation of the process all just happens seamlessly. And I think we're going to start moving towards that over the next two or three years. Yeah, it's an interesting one where I know um, having discussions with um, whether it be a small business owner or a finance, uh, um, financial controller at a larger business, um, it comes down to 
control when you're going through process change. The, the great thing about a lot of the solutions we're talking about now is actually it increases the control, like the example um, Dan gave with regard to the card payments. If you're issuing petty cash, you have no control over the, the minute way that that could get paid. Whereas now with so many of these solutions, the information you can get about that payment straight away um, can tell you when it's happened, what it's been for, and then you're able to react in the moment post that if there are issues. So you're actually gaining control, not in the old way of digital, meaning you lose control. It's it's really shifted for some people where those light bulbs are going off and going, wow, if I digitise, actually I get a whole lot more visibility and control over stuff that in an analogue world was quite clunky and invisible at a lot of steps in the chain. Yeah, that's 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 a really really interesting area to look at that as well, right? Is that control piece of the spend, and I see that being more and more important over the the next few years, especially as technology in particular, but this marketplace overall moves to consumption based, right? So if you're paying for AWS, you know you don't get a fixed fee every month. It's going to flex based on how you use it, uh, you know. And if you don't have the relevant controls. Um, yeah, our customers just set up virtual cards, lock it in and put a limit on there, right? But if you don't have that, well, then you get credit card shock at the end of the month. It's like the kids have been on the app store, you know, and uh, wrapped up a few bills on the cards and, and the buy-ins on there. Uh, I think, yeah, I think what's really going to be interesting over the next two to three years comes back to your first question, Laura, what's happened in the last two or three years? Because all that effective pause and change that we've had in that accelerated development is now as the borders start to open up again, as the movement starts to happen again, as we get out and go out and consume ourselves in the marketplace overall, it's gonna fuel the economy again. And what that's gonna shift, that, that movement is gonna really see that ROI from the investments made over the last two years. And I think what we're gonna see is another wave of innovation, another wave of uh, big steps forward. And I feel that we're gonna have a, a small business economy and a medium business economy in Australia, but probably around the world as well that is going to be really slick at adopting these emerging technologies, utilizing them and getting a competitive advantage, not just for themselves, but for, our, for Australia as well. That's a great comment. And uh, I want to throw it back to what you said before to VJ about uh, electronic data interchange. And we're seeing so much in the operation solution space, those vendors taking on sort of the same integrations that Zero have got at the moment, Mark. Um, and it's not just data flowing back to your accounting package, it's data flowing throughout all the systems that you're using to run your business. So it's for sure, it's a really exciting space. Um, look, I might just, in the interest of time, it's been such an amazing discussion. Um, I know that a lot of people on this call are gonna be very interested to hear your comments on this question, which is what happens to the finance team? So the biggest impact that finance staff experience because of, uh, sorry, what is the biggest impact that the finance staff experience because of the use of this enhanced technology? What are the benefits and the time savings? And I think probably more importantly, beyond that, what are people gonna do with their time once it's freed up? I love this question um, because uh, as anyone that's worked in, in finance or accounts payable or had anything to do with the processes, um, so much of a percentage of everyone's time is, is on fixing stuff where there's human intervention and humans um, inadvertently make errors because we do. Um, the, the beauty of when um, you're able to automate stuff is you're taking out an element of human interaction and in the vast majority of cases reducing errors that then those people's capacity can be focused on the probably the more stuff that they're more interesting, interested in, which is helping the business benefit from um, whatever their function is and being more proactive. So um, it's, it's not that you're, say for a larger business, getting rid of a, a department, although in some cases, if they're all looking after bank checks, that may be the case but in a lot of cases you're kind of allowing people to to do probably what they're they're more interested in which is the problem solving helpful rather than the reactive annoying um uh issues based stuff that comes with um errors 
Yeah, that's a really good point. When when somebody says to you, we've got technology that is going to have a 30% cost uh, or 30% efficiency gain, not such not, not, not great news for three out of 10 people in the team, you would think. But what experience has shown is as we see new technologies introduced in the accounting and finance area, the staff reskill and they move up the value chain. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, um, spreadsheets were only introduced about a decade before I started accounting. There's actually three times more uh, accountants now than there was prior to spreadsheets being in place. Why is that? Because it's cheaper to get a lot of that uh, manual stuff is now done. It's actually cheaper to get accounting advice, bigger demand. So, so what we think and the trends that we're seeing is that uh, finance staff are moving into higher value areas within the business. So instead of getting a call from someone in accounts payable uh, to, to pay a bill or resolve an error on it, you're getting calls about the business. You're using them for other uh, functions within the business. I just want to build on that slightly. Like the way we think about it, Divi Pay is finance is, is a hierarchy, almost like if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In finance world, you've got the, the admin and the mundane tasks down the bottom, like your reconciliation, your making of your payments, your accounting. And at the top of that um, hierarchy, you've got the concept of strategic finance. But what you see is a lot of people are stuck in that very bottom of the pyramid and they can't actually move up to strategic finance until that bottom is, is automated. So I think what we're doing is by automating the bottom, we're actually giving um, finance teams the ability to, to do more strategic finance, which I think is paramount, particularly if you look at the pandemic, like finance teams need to be making you know, forward looking decisions, not looking at three month old data and trying to analyze that, but going, you know, what, what is our hiring plan? What is our cash flow going to look like from a forward looking perspective? But they can only do that and have the headspace to do that if the bottom of that hierarchy has been automated. And that, you know, that's kind of what tools like Divi Pay and, and everyone here, um, that, that's the real value that, that we provide. Yeah, we yet to see anyone complain because data entry has gone away or chasing um, errors in because somebody's entered uh, 96 instead of 69 or we see very few complaints about that stuff disappearing. Yeah, look, I, I see the AP function was always seen as a cost center and a control center and, and not particularly supportive in that, oh, you can't send that over here, you can't do that over there. And that was built because the technology didn't enable them to do that. And I think uh, what we're seeing, at least anyway, is that the accounts payable team and the function overall are becoming, are seen more as an investment. Help me invest this cost, as you call it, Andrea, this cost bucket. Help me invest that better to get a better return. How do I optimize my AWS consumption, for example? How do I manage that better? And how do I get a better return on that? How, what's the best way to move this money around the world so I can lower my cost and therefore invest that into more supply, more advertising or whatever those elements are. Um, I, I think those are the areas that we're actually seeing and, I, and that's probably what I'd encourage businesses to do. If you're using traditional cards, if you're using traditional bank accounts, um, you know, or you're just using this zero in, even in its case, you know, have a look at those various areas that will help you use your cash better because it is your lifeblood and I feel that it's an area that's getting a lot of focus from the industry, from technology. So really, you know, sort of dive in and, and see how it can benefit your people. It's not a risk to jobs. It's actually job creation, in my opinion. I had a fantastic conversation yesterday with a very bright uh, financial controller who said that she saw herself as the driver of technology change in her growing business. And all of releasing herself from all of these tasks actually allowed her to be the conduit for that change and driver internally. And I thought that was fantastic. I'm conscious of the time and I want to go on to our last question. SaaS technology has made technology more accessible than ever to small and medium businesses, which used to only be available to large businesses. And we've talked about this throughout today. What's your view on adoption? What is the demographic of businesses that most commonly adopt your products successfully? And I guess in saying that, you know, is, is there a business that this type of technology just isn't suited for, perhaps? 
Maybe Daniel, over to you. Yeah, um, no, I think this technology can be used by absolutely everyone. I think Australia probably leads the way in SaaS adoption um, and shout out to Zero for really forging that path for the rest of us. You know, we've spent the last 10 years educating the market on the benefits of SaaS. And I know we touched on this briefly earlier, but what we're seeing personally is adoption has really accelerated off the back of the pandemic. <clears throat> you know, overnight, everyone had to start working remotely. And um, just because everyone works remotely doesn't mean you don't have employees still needing to make expenses. So um, you, know, you can no longer share the company credit card around the office. You can't drop an expense claim on the finance manager's desk. So for, for us, we actually saw an acceleration in adoption kind of off the back of the pandemic, people needing this single cloud-based solution um, to, to kind of digitize uh, payments and expenses and, and be accessible anywhere in the world. I think the companies that are most successful in adopting um, these products are the ones who already use you know, a SaaS platform in another area of their business. Could be um, you know, Salesforce CRM or uh, an HR tool. So um, if we acquire a business who doesn't have a lot of SaaS, it's just about educating them on the benefits. Um, but I think you, know, you can pretty clearly and quickly dollarize the value of your platform. Um, and at that point, people come around to it Come, come around to that logic pretty quickly. I think from, um, from our perspective, I, I, everyone has a bank account. And so that, that means that everyone should be looking at tools like their wallets, right? Obviously I prefer you use ours, of course, but do explore and see which ones are, are right for you in that regard. Uh, look, I, I think what we've done really well is make some of those functions and capability that was useful for, or that you could only get from the big businesses available to everyone. And the way that we've innovated means that if you're a startup, you know, you probably just go straight to our wallets. You may not even need a traditional bank account, right? Uh, and then as you're looking to scale up and you do go to go global, we see that tend to be uh, another space almost. Um, and you would have seen the recent announcement with Stake. Uh, now Stake are by no means a small business, you know, going you know, and operating in multiple markets, seeing some amazing things. And so I, I think it's less about whether which market you can serve, but how you can serve them. Um, and that, that's been a big thing for us in terms of making sure we can support and encourage and uh, you know, drive startup and entrepreneurship in Australia and across the world, uh, help those businesses that are already on the wagon to scale up faster. And then once we've innovated there, well, why wouldn't you, if you're a large business, take that innovation that's available there and use it in your own larger business as well? Yeah, for us, it's been uh, across the board, um, accelerated. I mean, we across our categories of apps, we've got the benefit of having vertical ones that are that are more specific to a particular industry vertical, but also the horizontal ones. So the combination of that is really a mix and match for any type of business, regardless of their size as well as industry. So um, yeah, it's been quite exciting. Yeah. We're not seeing across RSM a particular demographic adopting it because it really suits all businesses. Uh, what we are seeing, though, is the outcomes from it. And uh, as business advisors, we're now getting um, those businesses who've adopted it are getting better information uh, coming to us instead of asking, is the data correct? They're saying, what does the data mean for my business? So we're getting businesses that are adopting are actually able to change, improve their profitability um, and grow stronger than those that don't because they have a better understanding of their business quicker. But we don't see a particular demographic of business because it is. It's from small to medium to large business. It, it suits across the board. Wonderful. Yeah, I, look, I the way I look at accounts payable is that it is the easiest win and it's the hardest win. It, it's right at the crux of your finance function. And if you can get it right early on, it's going to open up that confidence or cloud finance around using other cloud-based technology, not just for your finance, but for your operations, for your productivity and the way you collaborate with your team. And then of course, growing and getting more sales. Look, I would love to say that we have lots of time for questions. Um, and however, our entire hour is up already. I don't know how that happened. Before we end, is there anything else that anyone wants to add? Just bur something burning you wanted to add to the end. 
just yeah, a warm yeah. thank you to to everyone on the panel. I had a great time. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. This is our first What's Next in Tech event, and we look forward to hosting many more on topics that are relevant for our clients and for our advisors at RSM. I want to say thank you not only to Zero, to Divi Pay, to Airwallex for joining us on the panel, but also for contributing to a white paper that you will actually be directed to when you sign out from this webinar, and you'll receive an email as well to download the white paper after this. I want to say thank you as well to Dext, Approval Max, and Lightyear as well for contributing to the white paper. They're fantastic partners of RSM, and we have many clients that are using those solutions as well. A copy of the recording will be available on our website as soon as we can get it up. And thanks to everyone for attending. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Bye.